welcome along to this Church at Home worship service. My name is Robin Brown and I'm the teaching elder in First Presbyterian Church Portadown, also known as Eden Derry. Following the latest lockdown restrictions, there will be no in-person activities in the church premises until February at the earliest. Please do keep an eye on the Facebook page or on the website for information of when there will be a resumption of our in-person worship services. The Bible study, the midweek Bible study on the book of Job, will be available online on Wednesday from 7.30pm. And it'll be followed at 8 p.m. by a prayer meeting on Zoom. There'll also be a prayer meeting on Zoom on Friday night at 8 p.m. And how to access these, you can find the details on the Facebook page or in the website or on the bulletin. Let's turn our hearts to worship God. And we read in Psalm 103 verses 1 to 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Let's pray together as we prepare our hearts to worship God. Let us pray. Father, we come to praise and to worship you. You are a God who delights to do good to your people. You come to us to meet our deepest needs. You have shown and confirmed your love in Christ that you didn't leave us in desperation. But he came leaving heaven's glory to walk in our midst, to die on the cross, to bear our punishment, so that all who hope in him might be forgiven and be with you. Lord, your love is without limit. It is amazing. May we love you. May we serve you. Father, forgive us. We know so persistently we choose our own way. We want to govern our own lives. We want to be in control. We will not humble ourselves before you as we should. We will not allow you to touch our hearts and shape them to be compassionate and caring like your own. Father, even as we think about these beautiful stories from your gospel, may we allow Jesus to work in us, to give us his heart, his purpose, his plan, both for our lives and for the lives of those we love. Lord, may we learn of you and live for you, we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to unite together and sing the words of praise my soul, the King of heaven.
Our text for study this evening is found in Mark's Gospel account, Mark chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 40 and reading into the second chapter, Mark 2, verse 12. Let's read together, remembering that this is God's word to us. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone but go and show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. And when he returned to Capernaum, After some days, it was reported that he was at home and many gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes who were sitting there questioned in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they were thus questioning within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. We give thanks to God for this reading from his word. Let's again join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Father, as we come to study this text, we will need your help. You must speak and we must hear you and heed you and make fitting response to you. Thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. May it guide us and help us as we seek to live in this dark and difficult world, bringing light to the nations and love to those who are hurting and struggling. And may we show you to live in us as we seek to live for you. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Once upon a time, this world was a beautiful place of which the Creator spoke and said, it is very good. It was a place where sin and sickness were unknown, a place where God was king and there was no resistance, no rebellion against his rule. One day, in a glorious future, near or far, we do not know, This world will once again be a beautiful place. It will be a new creation where sin and sickness will be unknown 
a place where God will reign as king and there will be no resistance, no rebellion against his rule. But we live between these two bookends. We live in a world where sin and sickness are all too real, too near, too soul destroying, too heartbreaking. In the midst of the troubles and tragedies of these days, where in the world is hope and help to be found? How can it be that we might share in the confidence of the psalmist who writes in those words with which we began our time together? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins, who heals all your sicknesses. As we continue our study in Mark's Gospel, we find in this text two instances where the presence and power of King Jesus intervene in this fallen world to drive back and to overcome sin and sickness. Thus, demonstrating the truth of his Gospel, that the Kingdom of God is at hand. This Kingdom is breaking in to restore our broken world. Now, Jesus has made it very clear that he has come to preach. Look at chapter 1 and verse 38. But Mark then moves on to record for us two stories of healing. Why does he not insert two sermons from Jesus at this point? Why does he here give us the account of two healing miracles? Well, we must be reminded that Mark's purpose in writing is to make the case for his great opening statement of chapter 1, verse 1, that this Jesus, who we encounter in these pages, is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and now in his coming, the kingdom of God is at hand. The future favour of God has invaded this world, this time. And in Act 1 of this drama, we meet the leprous man, verse 40. And a leper came to him. I suspect that now more than ever before, we have a, a better understanding of the plight of first century lepers in our experience of social distancing. Lepers were required to cover the lower part of their faces. They were to keep their distance. And they were to make their infected state known by crying, unclean, unclean, in order to warn others off. But here in this text, we discover that the leprous man breaks all the rules as he comes and kneels before Jesus. Lepers were to maintain their social distance from people and they were required to do this to acknowledge their spiritual distance from God. Leprosy was not like other kinds of illness. Above all those other sicknesses, this one was considered directly to be as a result of divine judgment. The people of that day believed that if you were suffering from leprosy, it was because God was angry with your conduct and therefore he had brought this punishment upon you. There are a number of biblical precedents. Miriam and Numbers chapter 12, she got mouthy about Moses' preferred status. Uzziah in 2 Kings 15, who got uppity and tried to play the part of a priest. Or Gehazi in 2 Kings 5 who got greedy and sought under false pretenses to take money from Naaman. Each instantly being struck with leprosy directly as a result of their sin. And leprosy is for us an illustrative picture of sin as it numbs the body to the impact of the sufferer's self-destructive choices. Those who contract Hansen's disease, as it's now known, have no sensitivity to physical harm. They are oblivious of the steps that they are taking along the pathway that leads to physical death. 
In a similar fashion, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of unbelievers and darkened their minds that the gospel is veiled to them. They don't realize that they are sinners. Thus, they are oblivious of the steps they are taking along the pathway that leads to spiritual death. And it is because of this, because of the close relationship between leprosy and sin, God's judgment, that we must see the weight of the statement that this man makes as he kneels before Jesus saying, if you will, you can make me clean. He's not asking Jesus to deal with his sickness. He's asking Jesus to cleanse him of his sin. He knows he is a sinner and he knows that Jesus can save people from their sins. He perceives that there is someone, the one before whom he kneels, who can deal with his deepest need. He knows that Jesus could heal him. His only question was, would Jesus be willing to heal him? Can his sin be cleansed? Does Jesus have a heart to heal? And Jesus' response is so telling. Moved with pity, says the ESV, and other translations have similar renderings. But in a sense, we, we have to be cautious here because our, our English words rather mask what is happening. As Jesus hears this request, he has a deep and a gut-wrenching response to this man's plea. Can this man's sin be cleansed? Yes. But even here, in this opening chapter of the Gospel, Jesus knows that for this to happen, it will require the horror of the cross. Toward the end of Mark's gospel, in Mark 14 and verse 26, there in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. The only way for this leprous man, the only way for the sins of the world to be forgiven is if the sinless Son of God will bear the just punishment of death in our place. Jesus must submit his will to his Father's will. And so Jesus speaks and says the words that this leprous man needed to hear, longed to hear, words that we all need to hear. I am willing. I am prepared to make the only suitable sacrifice for your sin. Be clean. He stretched out his hand and touched him. One of the reasons for my feelings of frustration and being a little hamstrung in ministry in this season is that I cannot reach out and touch people. I stand by an open grave, sadly too often in this past week, conduct a service of committal, pronounce the benediction, and then walk away. Until these last 10 months, Every funeral of the hundreds that I've conducted have always concluded with a handshake or a hug for the grieving family members. Appropriate touch is such an important, indeed an essential element of pastoral ministry, such as Jesus models for us here. He reaches out his hand. He expresses his willingness to enter into this man's suffering. He touches him. The first human contact he has experienced perhaps in years. And verse 42 ends with those so significant words. And he was made clean. I'll always remember 
reading years ago a, a very vivid illustration from the pen of Chuck Swindoll, who wrote of putting on a pair of pristine white gloves and then going out into the garden on a rainy day to dig with your hands in the mud. And he asked the question, did the gloves become muddy or did the mud become glovey? Swindoll's application was that if we compromise with the sinful things of this world, our lives will become stained. But here, here in this incident, the mud became glovey. The unclean leper became clean. The stain of his sin was washed away. The power of the purity of Jesus overwhelmed the defilement of sin in this man's life. And this is what the forgiving power of Jesus does in every heart that receives his renewing touch. There is no one too steeped in sin, no one too stained by sin that the touch of Jesus cannot cleanse and renew. Let's move on to act two of this drama. And apologies for skipping past the last three verses of this chapter. They are important verses. There's significant lessons that could be learned uh, from these words, but not in this sermon. We need to move on, having seen the leprous man, to meet the paralyzed man. In this much-loved story, the second man is equally in desperation, equally in need of the transforming power of Jesus. But he has a very different problem. The leprous man shouldn't have approached Jesus. The paralyzed man couldn't approach Jesus. But this man, as you know, was blessed in having four Faithful friends who refuse to be put off, bringing the one they love to receive the blessing that only Jesus could give. Once again, Mark shows to us the huge impact that Jesus has made on the wider community. News of his return to Capernaum meant that the house in which he was staying was, was so crowded, both inside and in the streets outside, to hear this message that Jesus was preaching about the nearness of the kingdom and the necessity of repentance. There was just no way that four men carrying a makeshift stretcher were going to find access to him. Don't we all love this part of the story? When they could have been put off, they could have decided, well, let's come back and try again another day. Someone in the group comes up with a bright idea of climbing up on the roof to gain access in this way. And so began the messy business of breaking through about a foot of clay mixed with reeds and twigs before lowering, lowering their friend between the rafters to where he could not be ignored by Jesus or the assembled congregation. And in verse 5, two unanticipated things happen. Firstly, Jesus sees and responds to the faith of the friend. It's not the faith of the paralysed man which gets his attention, although we have no reason to believe it was not present. It was third party faith that motivated Jesus to intervene. And we discover this throughout the Gospels. For example, in Matthew and Luke, we read of the servant of the centurion who is healed as a result of the, the, the centurion's faith, which Jesus marvels at. There's no record of what was going on in the heart of the servant. We will, as we reach chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel, see Jairus' daughter being raised from death as a result of her father's faith, a, a fearful, a faltering faith, nonetheless. And so we must learn the lesson. Fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, friends, work colleagues, neighbours, whatever the relationship be both challenged and encouraged that your faith in Jesus, the faith that stirs you to pray, to carry a heart's burden before his throne, 
is a faith that Jesus sees and to which he responds. The second unanticipated thing in verse 5 is that Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven. To the first time reader, this can appear heartless with limited earthbound vision. The assumption is made that this man's greatest need is to be able to walk. However, to the Bible teachers who were looking on, this to them was clearly blasphemous. These men knew the truth. Only God can forgive sin. But they fail to take the next logical step to realize that if Jesus can forgive sins, he must be God. Having accused Jesus of claiming to do what only God can do, Jesus does what only God can do and reveals that he knows exactly what they have been thinking. Mark 2 verses 8 and 9. And immediately... Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? Which is easier? With limited earthbound vision, the assumption is made that to forgive sins is easier. But hopefully we understand even in this brief confrontation with the religious leaders that Jesus is putting into process a a chain of events that will lead to his death on the cross. In his confrontation with these scribes, he is in effect signing his own death warrant. For the paralyzed man to be forgiven, for the leper to be To be cleansed, the Son of God would have to die. To restore power to wither limbs, like the creation of the stars, merely requires a word. But to forgive this man's sin, like the creation, the recreation of the new heavens and the new earth, it would require Jesus to bleed and to die. Now, if ever a man had a spring in his step, Surely it was this man as he squeezed his way through the crowds to be reunited with his good friends. But we must understand that that one day he would again lie on his bed, unable to rise and walk. One day he would breathe his last and he would die. And in that day, in that moment, it was not renewed limbs that he needed but a renewed heart, sins forgiven by the Saviour who gave his life that we might live forever and never die. As Warren Wiersbe comments, forgiveness is the, the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performs. It meets the greatest need. It costs the greatest price. It brings the greatest blessing and the most lasting results. These religious leaders had come to investigate. They had come presumably from Jerusalem to find out what was happening up north in Galilee. Perhaps they had come trying to figure out why all these lepers were suddenly turning up at the temple wanting their cleansing, according to the law, to be authenticated by the priests. And here... They have front row seats to the miracle working power of the one who takes to himself the name, Son of Man. And we must understand that the reason the scribes and Pharisees don't believe has got nothing to do with the evidence. It's not that there were not enough signs, that there was not clear enough proof. They disbelieved because there was for them too much to lose. They wanted to be in control and they choose rather to cling to their pride, their power and their prosperity rather than to kneel and to receive the rule of Jesus Christ in their lives. Two men 
met Jesus. And in their desperation, their humility, they were ransomed, healed, restored and forgiven. Other men and women meet Jesus. But in their arrogance, they remain hard-hearted and distant from him. One day, in a glorious future near or far, we do not know. This world will once again be a beautiful place. It will be a new creation where sin and sickness will be unknown, a place where God will reign as king and there will be no resistance, no rebellion against his rule. But even now, you can be part of his advancing kingdom with all its benefits. You can know the royal rule of King Jesus in your life. The one who, who, as Psalm 103 tells us, forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. May this be your testimony. May this be a truth that you know. That Jesus is your King. He is your Lord. He is your Savior. He is your healer. May you know that he has loved you with this limitless love that took him to the cross to bear your sin, guilt and shame so that you might live forever with him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that in Jesus there is all the help that anyone could ever need. Yes, Lord, the world will offer many alternatives, but nothing can equal him. There is no greater joy, no more lasting peace, no unconquerable security like having Christ ruling in our hearts and lives. Lord, may many in these dark and difficult days, choose to be part of this in-breaking kingdom with all its blessings. May they know the one who forgives all our sins, who heals all our sickness. Father, we know within our congregation and community there has been so much sorrow, so much sickness and death. We do ask that you would draw near to those families who are brokenhearted, and burdened, who have lost loved ones and have suffered that, that great anguish of seeing those they care so much for being snatched away from them. Be with them to bless them, to grant them your peace, your presence and your power at work in significant ways. May they know that as part of your kingdom, their loved ones are now with you safe from all the suffering and struggles of life, to live with you forever. In the meantime, Lord, for those who miss them, be their comfort, be their care. Lord, we pray again for those who are struggling with ongoing sickness, that they would know healing. We pray for our frontline healthcare workers and their weariness, that they would, as the psalm says, arise again with, with new energy, new strength, like the eagle. We pray, Lord, that they would continue to serve well in trying times, protect and care for many. Lord, use the vaccine as it's rolled out throughout our nation. May it save many lives, spare many from trial. Again, oversee this, we ask. Lord, look after our young people as they face challenges of homeschooling, of online learning, of of reorganized exam patterns, Lord, and all of this, give them a sense of peace that you're at work and doing good. Father, do bless the continuing refurbishment of our meeting house. Provide all that's required for this, that we would soon be able to gather there and praise and worship you. Lord, in the meantime, we thank you for the opportunities of online services. Bless those who gather around this message. May it speak into their hearts and bring wonderful truth to bear. So Father, we thank you for your word, the living word in Jesus and the, the written word of the Bible. May we know both well, and may our hearts be transformed by them, we ask to your glory. Amen. We're going to bring our time together to a close as we sing, There is a hope that burns 
within my heart. Thank you for taking time to join in this service. I hope it's been a benefit to you. And we pray that uh, as we continue to use this method of sharing God's word, that many would hear and respond. So now may grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.